Welcome to Behind the Mission, where we take a closer look at the duty bearers across the African continent, and we unpack the work that they lead on, as well as their vision to building the Africa that we want. My name is Janice Kumalo, and thank you so much for joining us for our second installment of this episode of Behind the Mission. Now today with me, we have a very esteemed guest. We have with me Dr. John Genkasong, who is the director of the Africa Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Now, before we get into this conversation, let me just start by saying, good afternoon, sir. How are you doing? I'm doing very good. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us. Now, let me tell you a little bit m more about Dr. John. He is a leading virologist with nearly 30 years of work experience in public health. Prior to his appointment with Africa CDC, he was the acting deputy principal director of the Center of Global Health at the United States Center for Disease Control and Prevention, as well as associate director of laboratory science and chief of international laboratory branch. We are so excited to have this conversation with you today, so please make sure you stay tuned for other episodes upcoming after this one. Now, Dr. John, the fight against COVID-19 is a race against the evolution of the coronavirus. The implementation of COVID-19 vaccines and good public health measures in Africa. There are vaccines that are currently available to provide good protection against the severe course of the disease. Is there currently a need to accelerate the uptake of coronavirus vaccination in Africa? There is absolutely a need to accelerate the vaccination program in Africa so that we get to at least a threshold of 70% of the population vaccinated. As we speak today, only about 15% of the population of Africa have been vaccinated, 15%. Compared to in excess of 80% in China, the United States, Europe, and that is why you are beginning to see that increased sign of optimism across the world where uh, some countries like the United uh, Kingdom and others are saying we are dropping all restriction measures. And the reason behind that is that they have vaccinated a high number of their population. And if you combine those vaccinated with those that have been infected, they have achieved a certain level of people in the community who have antibodies that are protecting the population. But on the continent of Africa, we are far from reaching the target of 70%. From moving from 15% to 70%, it will be a long journey. So that is why it is so critical, vitally important that for our own security, health security, for our own economic security, the continent should strive to vaccinate quickly to get to at least 70%. Thank you so much, Dr. John. I'm almost floored listening to those statistics, but thank you for that because it builds on the conversation and gives us a foundation for what we're going to be discussing next. And speaking of young people on the continent and their role specifically, why is it important to have youth as drivers to improve on speed as well as scale of uptake of the COVID-19 vaccination in Africa? That's a very good question. I mean, Africa is unique in the world. Uh, we are a continent of the future. We are a continent of the present because of the population structure of the continent. We are a young continent. 65% uh, of the population in Africa is less than 25 years old. 65%. So it is a continent that is bubbling and it's a continent that holds tremendous potential for the future. So. It, if that population size that I just described, the youthful population, do not participate actively, then they compromise their future. Because the herd, as we have seen during this uh, uh, pandemic, is uh, a determinant on our development, is a determinant on ec economic growth, and is a determinant of our own livelihoods. So uh, it's a strong appeal to the youths of the continent to take their future into their hands. Thank you so much for that, Dr. John. It almost seems negligible to not make youth the drivers of these initiatives specifically. And I love that you said that this continent is bubbling. It's bubbling with these young people and bubbling with excitement to move forward into this new space that you're describing. Now, the AU COVID-19 vaccination Bingwa initiative, and you're hearing this here first, is exciting, particularly as you lay out the rationale behind young people as mobilizers. Now, how do you envision that the work of this initiative will support 
Africa CDC's overall vision to see a sustainable increase in COVID-19 vaccinations on the continent? The, the population segment driving our economy on the, on the continent are the young people. Whether the young people that are driving the blue collar jobs or the white collar jobs or just the, the day to day economy are driven by the young people, the young women and, and men. So those are the game changers. Those are the people that have to take the, they have to ensure that the future of our own health security is in our hands and it is in their hands. Because as I said earlier, we are dealing with a generational crisis. Let's not make an error and get into a slot where we got into with HIV. When HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, was first identified in 1981 and up to 1983, we thought it was a disease for some uh, people somewhere else in the world. And today, it has remained a disease on the continent just because we didn't do the right thing. The young people didn't take leadership. The young people didn't take ownership of that. We are now today faced with another threat, a serious threat that is very disruptive in our economies, livelihoods, and begs the question as to what leadership role and ownership role the young people must play in this. So vaccination is a key instrument a vital instrument for us to turn the ties against this pandemic and the future is in the hands of our youthful population. I love that you said that young people are game changers and I think that is so apt to this conversation today. What is the best way to break the bias as well as some of the myths associated with the COVID-19 vaccination? The COVID vaccines save lives. COVID vaccines are safe. COVID vaccines is, access to COVID vaccines is access to economic empowerment. That is all. And uh, uh, women and young women, young girls have an important role to play in this because if you protect a woman's life, you protect a family's life and you protect the society's life. I think that is so vital as we celebrate uh, women's uh, 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 month or, or, or year this, uh, as we and fight this pandemic. If you look at the overall burden of where the continent has been most impacted, I can argue based on statistics that women have been most impacted than men because women are the breadwinners for the family. If they're infected, they are sick, the whole family crumbles. Uh, I love the fact that you even mentioned that, you know, we're not just celebrating International Women's Month. Women should be celebrated across the year. And even so, that women are the most affected uh, from this pandemic as well, that they are the ones, as well as young people, who should be at the front seat driving this initiative. Now, I think this may be my favorite question to ask, mm -hmm. uh, but to become the director of the Africa Center for Disease Control and Prevention, what steps would a young person say, like me, need to take in order to follow in your footsteps? I think, the, first of all, you have to be born by a woman. You have to be uh, married to a woman. You have to have a daughter. And if you have all those three women in your life, you ultimately become the director of uh, the Africa CDC. I think that was on a light note. But on a very serious note, I think um, it is what I call uh, the, the, the trinity of, of leadership. You have to be committed to the cause of public health, knowing that there is no personal gains in public health. In other words, if I wanted to uh, make money, I should be in the private sector. So you really have to be that love for people, that connectivity with people, and the ability to want to see people uh, they, uh, succeed because you have uh, you have lessened the burden of disease. Second is the your stain power. Some people call it uh, resilient, but I like the word stain power. Public health is difficult. I'll tell you, uh, clinical health, which is the health that a patient and a doctor sit and discuss the, the patient's illness and treat that patient, uh, you, you get immediate gratification from that. 
as a doctor. But probably heard, they don't even know that uh, there are people like us behind the scene working quietly to make sure that the population is safe. So it requires the staying power, call it resilient. Then the third and last thing is that you have to continue to uh, uh, climb uh, in terms of empowering yourself with the tools that will enable you to show leadership. Leadership in terms of identifying the problems, building the right partnerships, and making sure that you maintain those partnerships there. Those are the core ingredients that uh, enable you definitely to become uh, a good public health leader. So that is being committed, empower yeah. yourself. Empower. And the third one is? Resilient. Resilient. Yeah, be resilient. The trilogy of leadership. Yeah, the trinity of, of leadership is okay. what, I mean, it's those three elements in public health. You don't, I mean, you have to have the commitment. I mean, I'll give you some examples. We, how many times have you heard people say that uh, if you smoke, you have lung cancers, which is a fact. But how many times do you still see people smoking despite the fact that they know that they will lead to lung cancer? So that is the resilience and the commitment that, but you as a public health expert, you never say, well, I told you so. Okay, it is your responsibility to make sure that you still, you, you are the community's doctor to keep preaching and advising, finding ways to break that circle so that you can protect somebody's life. So that is the resilience and the commitment that I mean. I love that because also if you're going to be providing a service to the community, it's with no judgment and with the understanding that it has to continuously happen to, regardless of what it, the outcome is supposed to be. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that, Dr. John. And we have come to the end of this amazing conversation and we've come to the end of this episode, but thank you so much to the audience for tuning in and please make sure you stay tuned for the next episode of Behind the Mission. Now, from me, Janice Kumalo, over and out.